Straight Edges Chapter 4, Pain and Pleasure in Philosophies and Perceptions What do people mean when they say things like, there is no absolute truth, or there are no absolutes? I've come up with three guesses. Number one, we can never know absolutely what is true and what isn't. Number two, there is no absolute standard of morality. And number three, everyone has his or her own reality. So finally, number three, everyone has his or her own reality. Under this heading, there are at least two different directions we could go. I'll start with the more extreme first. That more extreme direction is a philosophy to which I alluded earlier. I'll call it mind over matter or matter doesn't matter. It's the idea that all matter is illusion and mind is the only reality, that mind is the boundary of all existence possible. Pretty hard to argue logically for or against this philosophy. However, let's see what we might be able to end up agreeing on, even in the midst of this philosophy. In high school, I learned about someone named René Descartes and his famous cogito ergo sum line, and that exhausts my supply of Latin. I think, therefore I am. Now, if I'm not grossly misinterpreting him, it seems to me that what the man was getting at was that if there was nothing else he could be sure of, the one thing he knew for sure was that he existed. How did he know? Because of consciousness. If nothing else exists, if the chair I'm sitting on is only in my mind, if the computer in front of me isn't real, if the words I'm typing and the fingers typing them, even the organ thinking them, are all figments of my imagination, at least it goes to show that my imagination exists. If nothing exists outside my consciousness, at least I know that consciousness exists. I said there was nothing I could know to be absolutely true that I couldn't find a way around imaginatively. I'm willing to make an exception. This would be it. I, whoever or whatever I may be, exist. I don't know that you exist, and I'm sometimes convinced that any readers of this book will forever exist only in my imagination, But I can know for sure that I exist, because I'm the one doing the thinking. And you know that you exist. You don't know that I exist, but you know that you do. Consciousness necessitates existence. I told you earlier that before we could look at the existence of God, we'd have to settle the matter of the existence of anything. I think René Descartes managed that task quite nicely for us. Something exists. Consciousness exists. Aha, but that means truth has done it. Truth has wriggled in. Even if we could agree on no other truth, I think we'd have to agree on this one. René found the ultimate axiomatic axiom. Unless logic is to be mercilessly mangled for the sake of novelty, I think, therefore I am, is indisputable. But that means that there is truth. We've found one we can't get around. Actually, that means we've found two. I exist, and so does truth. Even if truth consists of no more than those two statements, guess what? We've found some truth we can know, absolutely. But there's a little more that could be said on this matter of matter doesn't matter. So what if matter doesn't exist or doesn't matter? I exist, and I matter. To me, at least. That's also true, isn't it? To me, I'm very important. And to you, you're very important. I mean, what I experience, or imagine I experience, is very important to me. What you experience is very important to you. Pleasure and pain are very important to us. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, said the immortal bard, or at least one of his immortal characters. And it's true that any of us could live, bounded in a nutshell, and count ourselves the king of infinite space. If any of us really could manage to do it, if any of us could, in fact, make ourselves believe it to be true, were it not for what Hamlet calls the bad dreams. Sure, pleasure and pain wouldn't exist at all were it not for a mind capable of feeling them. They have no existence outside of a mind to process them, so I suppose in a way we could say that pleasure and pain are illusions. But here's the catch. Why do we all find ourselves incapable of doing anything other than thinking them so? Why, if I live bounded in a nutshell, can I never manage to think myself anything other than a nut? Are you tracking with me so far? Sure, maybe pleasure and pain have no existence of their own outside an experience of them, but the one thing we'd all have to admit is that we have very little control over our experiences of them. Who cares if hunger and tiredness and cold and sickness are all illusions? They feel entirely, completely, 100% real. 
And there's no convincing oneself that one shouldn't feel those sensations just because one doesn't want to and one doesn't believe in their reality. There's another factor that needs mentioning. I've gone on and on about belief and the importance of it. If matter doesn't matter, does that also mean that what we believe doesn't matter? Au contraire, mon ami. <laughs> Perhaps matter doesn't really exist. Who could know? But we know that mind or consciousness does. In that case, it seems to me that anything that goes on in the mind just may be a whole lot more important than anything else. We've established that I exist. I mean, I know I do. You know you do. And that this fact is important to all of us. We've established that pain and pleasure are also important because they feel very real, and we can't get rid of pain just by wishing it away. Now here's a little game of what if for you. What if what we believe can have a direct effect on the pleasure and pain we experience? I mean, I can see from my own experience that what I believe has some degree of control over a certain amount of my own pain and pleasure. For instance, if I feel cold, I mean, of course, if matter is illusion, that I imagine the sensation of being cold, it's unpleasant to me. In my belief system, I believe that putting on a sweater or turning up the thermostat will help, so I do it. Or, if matter is illusion, I imagine myself putting on a sweater or turning up the thermostat. One way or the other, it helps. The unpleasant sensation of being cold goes away. The same thing with being hungry. If I feel hungry, I eat. It helps. Now, if I believed that putting on a sweater or turning up a thermostat would do no good anyway because cold sweaters and thermostats are all illusions, then I'd probably just sit and shiver. So no matter what the belief system, we see that what we believe may have a direct effect on what matters to us, i.e. the amounts of pleasure or pain we experience. Now this only goes so far. I have only a limited control over the things I don't like. Because I don't like being hungry, I eat rather frequently. As a result, I've developed love handles. I don't like love handles. I like them more than the sensation of being hungry, but by and large, no pun intended, for whatever reason, I don't like them. I'd be more than happy to convince myself that they're illusions, but I don't find I can exercise that degree of control over my mind. Because in my belief system, another kind of exercise may help a little. I try to exercise, a little, and it helps the very little I thought it would. I also really don't like the sensation of exercising. If my mind had more power over my matter, I would be happy to imagine a way either my love handles, or the pain of exercising. So far, neither has worked. There are a lot of things I'd love to be able to convince myself of as effectively as I've convinced myself that my car doesn't desperately need its oil changed. What we believe may still be important and may still directly affect our pleasure and pain levels, but there are some things we can't do anything about just by wishing. For a more serious example, I'm one of the lucky ones in this world who can control the sensation of hunger by eating whenever and as much as I want. There are many who can't. Telling them to snap out of it and acknowledge that hunger is an illusion is probably not going to make them feel more well-fed. They apparently have no control over this particular painful experience, no matter what the belief system. It may, however, make me and my well-fed belly more comfortable to believe that hungry people don't really exist. Or it may spur me on to do something to help feed the hungry, if I believe that they do exist. My belief system may even have a direct effect on someone else's pain or pleasure levels. Now surprisingly, even if a person believes that matter is illusion, that person, being a BDP, a basically decent person, is probably still going to care about the issue of world hunger. That may seem odd if there is really no such thing as hunger or a world... But nevertheless, it is the kind of thing people, even mind over matter types, do care about. That's because mind over matter types usually care about right and wrong too, somehow. In fact, in our culture at least, it seems mind over matter types care a great deal about even trivial things like love handles and exercise. No matter what philosophy a person holds, we all seem to live as though these and other unpleasant illusions such as alarm clocks and daily grinds are very real and weighty matters. Maybe that's because none of us have found a way to make these illusions go away by simply ignoring them. So it seems to me that whatever the belief system one holds, the sensible thing to do is to live as though hunger and cold and hungry people and, yes, daily grinds and alarm clocks and love handles and oil changes are all real and need dealing with. Oh wait, that is what people do. 
So why live for all practical intents and purposes as though alarm clocks, daily grinds, love handles, oil changes, and all the trivia connected to matter are real and weighty? But hide behind a philosophy like this one to try to dodge the only matters that truly may be real and weighty. It seems to me that it's not quite playing fair if a person lives as though alarm clocks, love handles, and all are real, but ducks into the back alley of mind is the only reality to avoid meeting the likes of God and absolutes. Not only is it inconsistent, it also may be downright dangerous. Ultimately, even if all of matter is illusion, if mind is the only reality, does it matter when everything important goes on in the mind anyway? Sure, I could live bounded in a nutshell and count myself the king of infinite space were it not for the bad dreams, but so what? None of us can stop the bad dreams from happening. In the middle of a bad dream, it may help slightly to tell oneself, it's only a dream, it's only a dream, but it can't make the bad dream go away. The only cure for a bad dream is to wake up. Let's go back to our what-if game. What if one wakes up from this dream of reality into another dream, or another reality that there's no waking from? And again, what if what we believe can have a direct effect on the amounts of pleasure and pain we experience? What if what we choose to believe in this dream of reality is the deciding factor as to whether we wake up into a dream of bliss and delight or a bona fide nightmare? To quote Hamlet again, to sleep, perchance to dream. Ay, Hamlet, there is the rub, and quite the rub it is. When one starts to realize, especially as one must, if one thinks that mind is the only reality, that mind is very possibly eternal, then what if what we believe is very important indeed? In the what-if scenario I just gave you, there was no hard evidence, there was no logical argument involved, it was all speculation, so you probably didn't feel any need to be convinced by my particular what-if game. But you have to admit that the whole mind-over-matter philosophy will necessarily have to stay a what-if game. By its nature, it defies hard evidence and logical argument, it's pure speculation, and will have to remain so. But that doesn't stop people from buying into it. I can see why people duck into this particular back alley. I can see why the whole mind-over-matter philosophy is an attractive one, because people would like to be their own bosses and not have to be answerable to any mind greater than their own. That's people for you. They'll demand the hardest of hard evidence before they'll consider the claims of a creator. But after being shown it, promptly discard it with relief for anything else that comes along, even a philosophy for which no hard evidence could be possible. And then cry out, truth is unknowable anyway, so why bother trying? I say people because I am one. That's our nature by birth, and we need a new one. Although the mind over matter philosophy may, in some ways, be entertaining speculation, a fun idea, a good conversation starter when the party gets dull, Considering the risks, I'm not willing to stake anything of importance on it. I know that mind exists. I know that mine exists. I know that pleasure and pain exist, especially if mind is eternal. Then these are truly real and weighty matters. So what I believe just may end up being a very real and weighty matter, too. It seems to me that the sensible thing to do is not only live as though alarm clocks and daily grinds are real and weighty, but as though truth and absolutes are, too, and then to see what could possibly be learned about them. But that's me. Everyone has to decide for him or herself. Now let's talk about the other direction we could go with everyone has his or her own reality. With this direction, I have no argument, as long as we leave off an assumption people tack onto it. This idea is that all the reality I'm capable of apprehending fits inside the little six-inch by six-inch box I call my head. We do all live bounded by a nutshell. We call it a skull. Every bit of truth and reality I can get hold of is only available to me through perception, as interpreted by my brain. It's a little like the old idea of the tree falling in the forest. If no one's around to hear it, if there are no eardrums to pick up the vibrations of the crash, then did it make a sound? A sound is a sound only because of perception. Perception is really all we have of reality, and every individual's is a little different from every other individual's. The assumption people tack on is that because we all have our own realities, therefore all those individual realities are all equally true and valid. Not so, say I. I would argue that we all have our own realities, but we don't all have our own truth. A fairy story is real. It's not true. 
A lie is a real lie and can do real damage. It's not true. Everything imaginable has reality because it can be imagined, thereby bringing it into existence, at least in a mind. But not everything can be true. A one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people-eater can be given reality by my imagination, but that doesn't mean it's true. If there is truth out there somewhere, then not all those realities that we're running around with can be equally valid. Those that are closest to the truth are going to be, well, truer. But isn't it so that what's true for us, as far as we're concerned, is true because for us is all we have. Maybe one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people-eaters do exist, but because you and I will never know about them, then for us, they don't exist. I would agree to a point, for us is all we have, but not all there is. If there is truth out there, then in order for it to be truth for us, it must be accessible to us because for us is all we have. But do galaxies too far away for us to know about them not exist? They don't exist for us, but they still exist. Are all the strange creatures that live in the ocean depths that we haven't discovered yet not really there? Will our discovering them give them existence? It will as far as we're concerned. Until we're aware of them, they're not part of our reality. One-eyed, etc. Purple people-eaters won't exist for us until we know about them. But if they do exist, then they exist on their own terms, whether we know about them or not. There is more to truth than just our little realities. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, to quote the ever-relevant Hamlet again. Those who say that all our individual realities must be equally valid are forgetting an important fact. We're not born into a certain reality and stuck with that one for the rest of our lives. They change and broaden all the time. It's called learning. We learn about new galaxies. We learn about strange ocean creatures being discovered. When we use the word learn, there's an underlying assumption that learning means moving in the right direction. It means moving from a state of less understanding to more understanding, of limited perception to greater perception, of less truth to more truth. It's interesting that, again, it only seems to be in this whole area of a god and religious types of truth that people want to fall back on philosophies such as, everyone has their own reality, therefore all those realities are equally valid. At least that's the only context in which I hear philosophies like this trotted out. I've never said something mundane like, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, or Charles Dickens wrote Great Expectations and had someone respond with, Oh, really? Is that what you believe? Well, I don't, and we all have our own realities, and mine is just as valid as yours. No, somehow we don't mind agreeing about Abraham Lincoln and Charles Dickens, etc. Even though we do all have our own realities or perceptions of the true reality, on a day-to-day -day basis, we all live as though there is one umbrella reality, or truth, over all of them, connected to all of them. Well, most of them. Sure, my perceptions are the only piece of that greater reality that I'll ever be able to get my hands around, but we don't usually try to deny that there is that greater reality. Perception is the only cord I have linking me to that umbrella reality, but most of us would admit that perception is only the cord, not the reality itself. Otherwise, there's no point in talking about sanity. When a person's cord finally snaps, leaving her disconnected from reality entirely, and one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people-eaters become real for her, why would we medicate that person and call her unwell? That would be foolish behavior if we didn't believe in a real reality. But if there is one, then not all our individual realities are equally valid. If people want to deny that there is truth about truth, about moral absolutes, about God, then they should be open to the possibility that Charles Dickens freed the slaves and Abraham Lincoln wrote Great Expectations and Purple People Eaters do exist. Hey, why not? Why, I ask you, do people want to deny a greater reality? Truth. Only when it comes to the truly greater realities. We'd do better to stop hiding behind philosophies like everyone has their own reality. Sure we do. We all have our own realities. So why wouldn't you want your own personal reality to be as true and sane as it could be? It's a very good thing that learning is possible and perceptions can change and that we can go on to apprehend more and more of the truth. Again, let's get on with the truth hunt. But up pops the same old dilemma we keep running into. How can we know truth when we find it? How can we know whose perceptions are truer? Seeing we all have our own realities. Granted, they may not all be equally valid, but how can we know which ones are more valid? Seeing each individual's reality is real and valid to the individual. 
Our realities are real for us, and for us is all we have. Do you see where this leads us? I agree that if we are all there is, if there's no mind greater than ours, then all our realities would be equally valid, because there would be no one bigger than ourselves to actually know the truth, and no one bigger than ourselves to tell us the truth, which equals no absolute truth for us, and for us is all we have. But then I'd have wasted three whole long, tedious, meandering chapters showing the logical difficulties with the position of no absolute truth, and I'd hate to have wasted three whole long, tedious, meandering chapters. Here's how I reason. I've told you I agree that perception is our only link to the greater reality, just another way of saying belief is our only access to truth. But if we are all there is, then all of our individual perceptions are the only links possible to that greater reality. If we are all there is, then it's exactly the same thing as having no access to that absolute truth, because we all have different versions of reality and no one to tell us which is closest. It's just like the problem we ran into with all our different absolute standards of morality. We all see things differently, and no mere human would be qualified to stand up and say that his or her way of seeing things is the only right way. So if there is no one greater than ourselves, then there is no way for us to access truth, because we could never know if we'd accessed it. And if there's no way to access truth, then for us, there might as well be no truth. But that is a position that none of us can live with, as I've spent three whole long, tedious, meandering chapters demonstrating. Maybe mind is the boundary of all existence possible. In that case, I propose that some mind must know the truth, must know everything there is to be known, but then it must be some mind greater than ours. Whose mind knows about all the distant galaxies and strangest ocean creatures? Whose ear has heard every tree that ever fell in every forest? My point is this, unless someone knows the truth, then you're right. There is no truth for us. And if for us is not only all we have, but all there is, then there is no such thing as truth. And I reject the option that there is no truth as untenable. It puts us into a kind of Alice in Wonderland, oxymoronic, self-contradictory, ever-somersaulting universe that no one could live in. That's why whatever people may think they believe, they all live as though there is truth and it is accessible. There's just no other way to live. All this leads me to embrace the option that there must be one greater than ourselves. And if we're ever to know anything about this one and about truth, if it ever is to be truth for us, if we're ever to be able to have access to truth, then this one must be capable of communicating with us. It all comes back to this reliable source idea again. So I think a reliable source must be accessible to us. I even think it extremely likely that a reliable source has been trying very hard to communicate with us and given us great glaring signs pointing the way. And now we may have come to that point where I say, well, I believe such and such. And you say, well, I don't. And there's an end. Just as long as you realize that by so saying, you've affirmed that all viewpoints and realities are not equally valid. Not if you're disagreeing with mine. For the sake of getting a move on, let's pretend that you've agreed with me, at least as far as to say that maybe there is a good possibility that truth exists and that it just may be worth searching for. Uh-oh. Once a person does that, it means there's no more hiding behind excuses or philosophies. The truth hunt is on. If you're setting out looking for truth, I think the best way to do it is to expect or at least hope to find it. None of this hoping not to find it. When you lose your car keys and you set your whole household to searching for them, it would be pretty silly to do so if you were expecting or even hoping not to find them. If one of your household calls out, Found them! Do you call back, Don't be absurd! Those can't be the car keys! The car keys are lost! The car keys can't be found! We're only looking for them! We're not supposed to find them! Yet, this seems to be how a great many people approach a truth search. I've heard people quote catchphrases like, it's the journey that counts, not the destination, with a lump in the throat and a tear in the eye. Yet, if this particular philosophy left the realm of philosophy and entered our everyday reality, it would produce a different kind of lump in the throat and tear in the eye. How would you like to board a flight for London and end up in New York? Because, well, it just happened to be a nicer journey, that's all. And after all, it's not the destination that counts. Yet, this is how many people approach a truth journey. 
It doesn't matter where it takes them, or so they think. It doesn't have to take them anywhere as long as it makes them feel good along the way. There's another philosophy people like. It's the one about all the individual various roads winding their individual various ways up the mountain, but all reaching the same peak. All roads lead to God, they quote airily. Granted, but which God would you like to reach? All those individual various roads are only going to reach the same peak if they're winding their ways up the same mountain. I've said that if I were setting out on a truth search, I would want to start by looking into some sources that at least claim to be reliable. Yep, I'm talking about religion. By religion, I mean an organized system of beliefs about the greater realities, about the important stuff. I don't know much about any religion other than my own. I do know enough to know that all those roads are not heading up the same mountain. If it was just the journey that counted, then I would say, go for it. Pick the one you like best. Pick the one that's the most fun. But I happen to think the destination is what counts. I happen to think a reliable source should be reliable. There's a reason there are so many different religions. It's because they're all different. They all say very different things, and those differences are not surface differences. The most preliminary investigation of religion will show you that. I can understand why people would want to find the lowest common denominator of all religions and meld them into one because of all the fighting that's gone on throughout history over religion. There's a reason so much fighting has gone on. It's because the differences in religions are about the important things, and the differences are important ones, important enough to fight about for those who hold to them. Now, I'm all for not fighting over religion. I'm all for an open exchange of ideas, which doesn't have to mean a fight. This is yet one more example of those religious differences that people consider important enough to fight over. Those whose religion demands fighting over religion would disagree with my ideals that there's no reason to fight over religion. It's not usually those traveling on one of those roads winding its way up a mountain that airily say, all roads lead to God. It's those who would rather not be bothered having to travel one particular road and so hope like mad that it can't matter in the end anyway. Or truth searchers who hope that truth can't be found. But that's not how it works. It's that hard, old, uncompromising nature of truth again. If a thing is true, then whatever directly contradicts it cannot be. If Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, then Charles Dickens didn't. If Chucky wrote Great Expectations, then A.B. didn't. Truth doesn't allow us to have things both ways. I'm not saying that all religions don't contain some truth. Usually everything does. But I'm talking about the important truths here. That's where all religions differ fundamentally. There's no way around it. When it comes to the important stuff, if Christianity is true, then Hinduism isn't. If Hinduism is true, then Islam isn't. If Islam is true, then Buddhism isn't. If Buddhism is true, then Christianity isn't. They do all lead up a different mountain to a different god, and for myself, I've been convinced there can only be one true one. I don't know a great deal about any of the other world religions. All I know is that if the claims of Christianity are true, then Christ is the only way to God. That means none of the others are. I've been convinced of the truth of the claims of Christianity, then to me there's no need to try and prove all the others false. All that's needed is for one to be proven true, and then all the others are proven false. I won't be delving into a study on comparative world religions. All I'll be hoping to show you in this book is why I, personally, have been convinced that the claims of Christianity are true. Seeing you're on a truth hunt, I presume you are if you're still reading, you might as well start your hunt by examining those claims. So carry on. You've got this far. Maybe the worst is over. All right, truth hunters, are you ready? Here we go. Here we go.